Okay, Caroline Burkle, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate you coming on. So uh, I'm looking at your uh, website right now, and it says Olympian, entrepreneur, designer, <laughs> artist. Which one do you identify as? <laughs> Actually, that website is extremely old, and I need to update it. Uh, well, it's not really old, but it's, I don't really keep up with that website. And it's funny you ask what I identify with, because right now it feels... Um, like a big transition time for me in my life. And I honestly don't really feel that I identify with one specific label or title. Uh, I feel like it's ever changing and all of them are a part of you. You just have to find which one you tap into at a certain time. So I can't really identify with any of them or maybe identify with all of them. Uh, it just depends on kind of how you, what lens you're looking through. Yeah, so where, you know, I mean, obviously they, they came to you at different points in your life. Uh, you know, Olympian is something that you, you probably pursued from a, a very young age in swimming. And then, uh, you know, you come from a very successful family as well. And so the entrepreneur side of you has probably been instilled from a young age as well. What about the design and the art? When did that come about? Mm. I was in high school, actually. Uh, the, you know, the first time I really recognized that I was different than everyone else as far as, you know, I grew up in the South. It, it was a very uh, straightforward culture of, you know, a lot of people had the same minds with math and science, and mm -hmm. it, which is interesting. Like, I guess you wouldn't really think of it, but there's not a lot of artists or, you know, I didn't really grow up around that mindset of art and like photography and like different cultural uh, norms. So I felt very weird. And I, I was at an all girls Catholic high school. I was, I was taking IB art, which is kind of like AP. And I recognized that I had this love for it. And I was very doubtful of myself. Like I didn't really believe that I should or felt like I shouldn't really tap into that. But that was when I first really fell in love with uh, art and the way that I felt expressive and more myself when I was creating. So it was probably freshman, sophomore year of high school. Oh, wow. And then what kind of art were you, yeah. were, you know, leaning towards? We did a lot of painting, like monochromatic paintings. I painted a lot of my youngest brother, Colin, because he was a baby at the time. So we did a lot of portrait work. Uh, I took photography for two years and that was like old dark room style processing of photos and that was really, really fun uh, as well. But I, I always loved just basic charcoal pencil sketching and shading and uh, very simple things. I didn't really like a lot of messy, crazy, uh, super colorful stuff. I was a lot more, uh, I leaned a lot more toward the minimal feel of art. So a lot of monochromatic stuff, black and white, charcoal pencil. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. so, and how does that kind of manifest in your life these days? What are you doing with it these days? Yeah. So after I retired from swimming, which was 2010, 11 ish, um, I, well, I was transitioning during my last year at the fashion Institute of design and merchandising. So I was, living in Orange County, Katie Hoff and I were roommates, and I was going to the Orange County campus at FITM, and I was in merchandise product development. So it was just a calling, like I felt it, and I felt like I, I couldn't ignore that anymore. You know, in college, I majored in sociology because if you didn't have time, I couldn't major in art because all mm. of the labs were in the middle of swim practice. So I had to choose, and I chose swimming. So I dropped out of art and photography, uh, major in college and I switched to sociology which was just the, the most simple way of kind of transitioning my mind into that space because uh, psychology labs were also in the middle of swimming so I didn't go that route um, so I I decided to go to FITM when you know I was kind of retiring from swimming and that was awesome and when I finally retired retired I transferred to the uh, Los Angeles campus so I moved in to Beverly Hills and Haley Pearsall and I lived together for about a year and a half while I finished there. And that's how it all began. Um, I didn't go into it right away. I loved being at school. I loved being at FITM, 
but I didn't go into fashion or art or design or product development right away. I kind of actually went into a bit of a depressive cycle there for a while. So I put everything on hold and, um, and now I'm getting back into it. It has uh, resurfaced in my life about a year and a half, two years ago. And it started with actually <laughs> started sketching again when I had a horrible concussion. So during my recovery, I was not really able to work. I couldn't really look at screens. I couldn't think <laughs> at all, really. I was really struggling with vertigo. I couldn't uh, stand up, move around much. So I would just sit and sketch. And um, that brought it back for me because it was something that I could do with repetition and with uh, tranquil mind that brought me back to myself. And ever since then, I've used it in different ways. And now it's evolving into more of a design uh, pursuit. So my sketches are my inspiration for design. So I'm working towards that again. If oh, that's that very is cool. a nutshell version of that. <laughs> No, that's that's cool. Yeah, I mean, you you brought up a point there too of like after swimming, you kind of went into this period of time where you, of self discovery and you, and you didn't really know what to do or who you were in that mm -hmm. sense. And I think we all kind of experience that as 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 athletes too. You know, I, I remember I finished swimming in two thousand and six, and and there was that period of time like, what do I do now? Because everything is just so constant and it's so normal to get up, go to practice, work hard, improve, go to a meet, compete, you know, and do the cycle all again. And, and you're just in yeah. this lifestyle and then, and then it ends and it just doesn't seem like there's anybody there to help you carry your bags. Does there? No. Yeah. And you know, my, my experience with it wasn't even as much of the routine the loss of routine as it was the loss of um, proving my worth, which I'm just now realizing uh, mm. was the entire theme of that. So, um, you know, I, I had a hard time during my swimming career for several different reasons. And I didn't, I pushed it, a lot of it down and I pushed it aside uh, just to get through it. And so when I retired, it was like, I don't know what I'm worth. Like mine was a very worthiness, driven depression and, and I you know I am always hesitant to use that word because it gets thrown around our society a lot but it's it's real and it's um there are levels to it and there's not one size fits all of that so everyone's going to experience it differently uh, my first experience with it was disguised as um chasing and running uh, so, you know, I chased different goals and I, I had a, such a strict routine, almost more strict than when I was swimming, uh, so much to a fault of just like total control. Like my whole life was controlled. I controlled everything, the way I ate, like the amount I ate, I didn't eat enough. I was controlling my, ex my workouts. I was pounding my body to the ground with all these different random races or, or random fitness things because I just didn't know. And I, and I didn't know what I was supposed to be worth. I, was, I thought I had to prove myself again in this other realm of life. Um, so it was a way of distracting myself and of running away from my real problem, which was that I didn't feel worthy of, it, of existing without this, this thing that, that had driven my life. Um, and, you know, just as a woman, to be honest, in that phase of life, you just, your worthiness to be loved and your worthiness to grow past this thing that you, that you thought was your relation, you know, that has been your relationship forever. Um, it really threw me for a loop because I had no clue how to find that again. So that was my first experience of it. And then when you finally stop to... Uh, you know, I mean, mine was a forced stop. My body literally broke. My, my heel broke not once but twice, and I had the concussion. And, you know, I was literally sitting still for almost three years, two and a half, three years. And it was the first time in my life that I was, like, faced with all of the things that I was running from. Um, and you have to sit still <laughs> to finally realize that and to figure it out because I think it's a very – we're a doing culture. We, we do, do, do. We, we have to continue to do sometimes uh and we run away from feeling and i think it's just a, a fine balance between the two you have to have the best of both in order to perform on any level um so that has been you know and that's a long long story all that's a very long story but you know in a nutshell version again that has been my experience with it is is that it was first disguised as running and as proving myself and as um 
going through that experience before I actually healed the experience, before it actually hit me, before I actually saw it for what it was. Um, which How'd you just get to that point? Literally, was it? literally <laughs> a year ago, two years ago. Was uh, it with friends or yeah. family or therapy or yoga or, you know, what was it that got you to that point? Well, and yeah, all of those tools are very helpful. Um, but again, it wasn't one thing. It wasn't one thing that I did. There wasn't anything that, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a big believer in stopping the prescribing of things to help us figure things out and actually just Mm. becoming aware and becoming real with yourself. And so for me, it was a, it was obviously a combination of all that, but for me, it was my own choice to dive into and to get very curious with what was going on. Because at a certain point when I had lost 40 pounds on my body mass and I was sick and I, I didn't have periods for 10 years after I retired and I didn't have any bone density and I'd broken my heel twice just, literally almost sliced all the way through just from running and, you know, and I, and I get a concussion and I'm in the hospital and like all these things, like they woke me up because after a certain amount of time of experiencing them, you're wondering and you're questioning and you're getting curious, like why? And I think that there are such beautiful things that we do like yoga and uh, therapy. And yes, I do both of those. I'm still, I'm in therapy, you know, once a week and I have been for a long time. Um, Mm. but the, the real way is curiosity and yourself. And if you're not curious and questioning your thoughts and, and beliefs and your feelings on a regular basis and trusting that you can get curious with them and not, um, judge them, you know, like just becoming curious with them was Mm. what changed my life because I finally said, stop the running. Like what is going on? What, you don't need to judge yourself. You don't need to analyze yourself. There's nothing wrong with you, but like, what is really wrong? What is really going on? Because your body is teaching you something, you know, like it's, it's teaching you that you are running (laughs) and that you are, broken right now literally like you know you've broken bones so so what is what is that telling you our bodies always tell us something um so that that's my best answer for that i think that ways to do that of course are meditation and yoga and therapy and all of that but at the end of the day it's your decision no one's going to do it for you and Mm. you have to get super curious with yourself and rely on people for support but knowing that you're responsible for changing your state in the the best way that works for you um yeah, so That's I think it's, awesome. a, it's a nice blend of it all, yeah. Yeah, well, this is part of the reason why I wanted to talk with you. I, I don't know you that well. I just know from the outside looking in, and I see some things, and it, it to me it looked like uh, a young woman who has had a lot of success in swimming and been, and been very successful and then gone on to really go on this path of discovery. And I, and I kind of wanted to dig into that a little bit, so I'm glad you were able to share with us there as well. So you know, just looking yeah. back on your, on your swimming career, do you look back on it with any, um, you know, regrets or, I mean, obviously when I look at it on paper, I'm like, wow, what a career, you know, it was, you, you swam at the university of Florida, you, you swam for the U S at the Olympic games and won medals. You broke NCAA records, all the stuff that every swimmer would dream of doing. How was that experience for you? Yeah. It's funny you say that actually, because I feel in a lot of ways that my my time swimming was amazing for sure. But do I think I could have done better? Yes. Um, do I think I could have performed better? Yes. Do I think I, I had more in the tank? Yes. Do I think that a lot of days uh, I question why I didn't? Yes. <laughs> So I think it's, it's, no, it's not a regret thing, but it's knowing that no matter what in my life, what, whether it's swimming or, you know, fashion or design or sketching or family or friends or relationships, like looking back, hindsight is always, I, I know that I can be better. And so as I grow and as I get older and realize, and it's such a cliche saying, like, as I get older, but it's true, like growth happens and, you know, in our concept of time, quote unquote, but every year I recognize 
that I'm not going to change wanting to get better. Like I don't look at things and say, oh, wow, what a, that, that was just, yep, that's it. Like I'm very proud. I'm, I'm very proud of myself and I'm very happy. But you can also at the same time be striving for more and looking at the areas that you could do better and applying that to your life now. Um, and for my, for me personally, it was a lot of, uh, self doubt and questioning, you know, like, uh, am I good enough? Is this enough? Am I pleasing someone, et cetera, and learning those lessons now and applying it to my life so that I can make everything as much better as it can be, you know, as, as best it, as it can be. Um, I think that's the whole goal of life. Like you're never going to be totally like, Oh, that was it. Like Life is over. I'm just going to hang up the towel. Like, you know, it's awesome. I think the true champion and true human that is always striving for better is a very positive quality to have. So it's being happy with yourself, being very proud of yourself with the benchmarks you've achieved, but knowing that's not the end all be all and that you can apply that to your life now. Um, I think that's, that's the real ticket there. That's, that's amazing. I was, I was going to say, do you look back with pride of anything that you achieved and you did answer that in a way. So, so that's good to know because I, like I said, when I look at it, I'm like, wow, she, she accomplished so much. And it sounded like originally mm -hmm. you, you were saying that you felt like, uh, almost like you didn't accomplish much at all, you know? And so uh, mm -hmm. I just didn't know how you, how you looked at that as well. How did you end up picking the university of Florida? How did that come about? You know, I, um, I love the co-ed team atmosphere. So I wanted to train with guys. And I think growing up at Lakeside Seahawks, you know, in Louisville, Mike DeVore was our coach and he's a legend. Um, but he, I was always training with the boys and I liked that. I liked it. I, I don't know why. And, and, you know, I think that now that, you know, I think about that and I say that it's like, you know, of course women are amazing and powerful to train with too i'm not you know definitely not saying that but yeah. at the end of the day i loved training with the guys because i felt uh maybe it was just growing up with brothers or training with a lot of guys on my on my club team but i loved that uh energy and i loved the camaraderie of men and women's teams together so that's why i chose that you know arizona was my second choice so it was very um close call, but I wanted to stay in the South and I needed palm trees instead of cacti. And, you know, mm -hmm. so that was my, uh, that was my decision there. And I also was very close with Mike and he was best friends with Martin Wilby. So that was like a very easy family feeling to go into. Yeah. Who was your primary coach at Florida? Uh, Greg Troy and Martin. Yeah. Um, Martin probably because he was the middle distance freestyle coach and I did dabble in breaststroke. I swam breaststroke a lot. So I would go with coach Troy and stuff some of the mornings of the week, but yeah, I mean, Troy of course was head coach, but Martin was the 200, mainly the 200 freestyle coach and the women's head head coach. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's cool. You know, uh, 2008 was a year where you were, very successful and you you were named ncaa female swimmer of the year that year i believe is that mm -hmm. is that a year where you feel like you can look back on and, and feel proud of and you had success that year that's actually when people ask me what my most proud experience is it's that uh olympics of course amazing and all the other international meets of course amazing but my most proud moment was ncaa my senior year and i think because i had given my whole heart and soul to that team and it was a tumultuous ride. You know, Florida was hard. Uh, Greg Troy is a tough coach. And, you know, we, we had a lot of long days, a lot of long hours, and a lot of long practices, and a lot of really emotional moments just in growth. And, um, you know, him and I had a really good relationship towards my senior year. But before that, I was always, um, I wasn't a trainer. So, I had a tough time in practice, like meeting the the goals that were set out for me. And so there were a lot of years, a couple of two years at Florida where I was full of self-doubt and I didn't have a lot of um, confidence in myself. So 
being able to win that and to break the American record, which was, of course, my idol, Janet Evans, uh, at, at the time, uh, she, you know, that was just super cool. Like, she reached out to me after that and was like, this is amazing. I'm so proud of you. Um, you know, I, I'm, it has been an 18 year record and I, I'm, if anybody would want to break it, I'm glad to see you. And I was just humbled beyond. So to, to win something like that for the team, the team that I had so much heart in and had gone through all the ups and downs throughout the four years at college was just, just the cherry on top, I think. Yeah. So. It was the oldest standing record on the books at the time, mm -hmm. the Janet Evans record. Mm hmm Obviously, yeah. her being one of your idols and, and the record being so fast, is that something you had set out for at the start of the season or was it something that progressed maybe into a belief that you might be able to get or was it a total shock at the end? You know, I was a silent, I, I was like a silent killer with stuff like that. Like I, I, I didn't ever talk about any of it out loud. Of course I wanted it, you know, coach and I would sit down and go over my goals and all the things that I wanted to achieve. Um, I always knew that I was going to, you know, like I, I always, I knew these things. I knew that I was going to make the Olympic team. I knew that I was going to win NCAAs. Like I knew it. I knew it deep down. And no matter how much doubt crept in, I still had the intuitive feeling and belief that I was going to. And, um, you know, I think I really started to believe it and know it more about, hmm, I would say, middle away from my junior year. And that was when it was like, all right, I'm, I can do this. There's no reason why I can't. And my, my most proud moments are the moments that I would pick myself up after the worst dual meets of my life. And, you know, I did, <laughs> I did not perform in dual meets. I mean, to put it in perspective, I went, I think, what, fourth 33 in the 500. Yeah. Uh, in Chibli. My dual meets would be like 502. <laughs> wow, that is and so I, I would just break like I was I, I broke down like no one's business like I was a very um, I, I would get very very broken down as an athlete and so once we learned how to to train myself I guess and with good communication and, and working through that it got a lot better but I didn't really you know I didn't really know no until middle of my junior year but I always knew I always knew deep down that I could I just didn't know exactly how or when or what that looks like. Mm. You've mentioned those doubts a few times creeping in. When would they creep in the strongest for you? What, when, mm -hmm. at what point did you notice them really kicking in? <sighs> when I wouldn't do well at dual means, you know, and I'd have to pick myself back up from that. But I think it really, to be honest, it crept in the most when I didn't feel heard or understood. Mm. Um, and this happened a lot my sophomore year. So I had an outstanding freshman year. I won SECs, was second NCAAs in all my events. Like I was very, I came in hot and I loved it. <laughs> I was like, yes, this is great. Mm. So then my sophomore year, I had all the self doubt because I had these expectations looming over me. Um, not just for myself, but from coach and from what I thought quote unquote was the world. And so I struggled to explain myself. Um, I was not your typical ass swimmer athlete that needed to know their splits, that needed to, you know, train like I would train, like other people that trained for the 500 would train. Um, I just didn't. And I, tr I kept trying to explain that, you know, like I'm broken down and, and I don't do well with numbers and splits. So we need to find another way, whether it's tempo or, you know, images or imagery or whatever, but I, I can't, I, I just don't. And mm -hmm. so, that took my entire sophomore year and we just battled back and forth because I had no idea how to, how to articulate that. Um, and then we had a huge meeting. Um, I, I hit my rock bottom of self doubt, like huge rock bottom of self doubt. We had a big meeting um, and I was crying and crying and crying. It was like a three hour meeting up in his office. And, and, you know, we talked about, what works for me, like what doesn't work for me, what works for me, why, what fears I have, why I feel like I can't do the same things as everyone else. And, and it all amounted to, I just need to figure out a different way to assess my races and to perform in that way. And after that meeting, and from that day on, I was lights out because it was, he no longer gave me my splits. 
no matter what we did in practice, I never heard my time. Mm. Um, I only heard my tempo. And there would be some days when I would walk in and he would just look at me. And he would look at my eyes or something and big bags or exhaustion or he could just feel it. And this was like, you know, after time. And uh, he would just say, I just want you to get in and do a thousand leaps and get out. Mm. I'm like, okay. You know, and it wasn't liked. I mean, my, my teammates didn't like it. Um, it wasn't fun for me, you know, to feel like I was doing less than others. But it, it worked. And it worked not only because I was heard. But it worked because I rested myself more from the things that were not working for me. And it doesn't mean it doesn't work for everyone else, but I needed to communicate that and also accept that I can hear all those things, but I have to figure out what works for me. And that's to listen to my tempo and to have images per, you know, race pace and all this. Like, I, I just thought differently than others. Um, so that was when self-doubt was the, the highest, when I didn't feel heard and when I didn't uh, or, or communicate with my coach, like, what I felt like I needed or what I felt like could work in a way that was still hearing him and still hearing, you know, what I, what was expected of me as well. So, um, yeah, that was, you know, boils down to lack of communication is when I doubted myself the most. Okay, cool. So then obviously the, the flip side of that is when you are heard and then you, you're not, you're not getting the things that you don't need and, and you're getting the things that you need, then obviously you get to this situation where you're very, very confident, right? Yeah. And you, you know how to bounce back faster. You know, the feedback loop is tighter. You know how to bounce back faster. So it's like something's not good. Quickly revert to, okay, well, your tempo was 1.4 supposed to be 1.2 you know so it's like okay so I get it and so the mm. feedback loop was tighter and more specific to what I needed versus okay you're 29.6 you're really 24 or 26.2 you know so I'm like well I don't know that just doesn't work for me like yeah. I, I don't know how to gauge that for me and yeah. so um you know that feedback loop gets tighter so mm. uh that's that's how I think that that changed the most cool what about your experience in swimming in an Olympic final, what was that like for you? It's uh, really awesome. Um, I don't remember it, to be honest. You know, you're <laughs> in flow. You're, like, in that state of just it, the crowds. And, yeah, I remember, like, specific parts of it. But the actual race itself, the actual feeling of performing, I barely remember what I felt like in that race. And, um you know, I, I still don't even consider it one of my best races. <laughs> like, I know I could have gone faster, but the camaraderie and being a part of a team and representing our country, um, you know, in China, it was interesting because finals were in the morning, so it was definitely a different vibe. Uh, but it was really, really cool to experience that and to be in front of the world on that stage and trust yourself that you belong there um, with your teammates. So it's a special thing being on the relay as well, I think. You know, my brother got to represent himself and the country individually, but it it was cool to be a part of a team too. Um, but I can imagine that individual individual race is pretty special. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. You just mentioned that. You know, your brother swam at the Olympics as well. That's that's a pretty outstanding family right there. To have two two kids. <laughs> um, what what do you take yeah. from, from your parents? How did they how did they set that up for you guys so you guys could both be very successful at the highest level? We get that question a lot. I don't really know. You know, I think our my parents were very supportive. Um, we just watched them and to be honest they worked hard like they're entrepreneurs we grew up going to work with them kind of thing like that was just our life and so I think we saw it from a young age and also they were great at asking questions um you know I don't really know they they were not hands-on like there was not a crazy like go to every practice like they didn't come to any practice they never came to one single swim practice like they just picked dropped us off picked us up like they they were so supportive in that way and you know of course we have our challenges with our parents like especially as teenagers and things like that but for the most part I think Clark and I push each other um I think that they were both athletes my parents were but at the end of the day Clark and I push each other he's a polar opposite than I am uh exact opposite he likes times and splits he knew all of my times and splits he knew all of my everything uh my rankings where I stood what I needed to be what lane I was in like he knew all of that and he was a very serious swimmer like he would 
prepare for his races like 20 minutes before behind the block. Like he was just very into it. I, on the other hand, would miss my races because I was laughing over in the warm down pool. So <laughs> I don't, you know, we, we balance each other out that way. And I think it, we both frustrated the hell out of each other at a lot of times. But at the end of the day, we learned about what the strengths were. We learned the strengths from each other and it could apply them to our own races. Like, so he, he focused me and I think I gave him the ability to smile, you know, in that way so that he could, um, perform with both but he was a really good athlete like Clark's just an athlete <laughs> he can take months off and come back and still kick everybody's butt <laughs> so it's like um he's he's a great athlete um yeah. but yeah we I think we ended up just pushing each other well you know um I think that was the main thing there well that's cool that you guys seem like you have a very close relationship too and very supportive of each other and he sounds like he's super mm -hmm. proud of you if he if he knew what lane you're in and things like that then, <laughs> you know, that's that's a caring brother i don't think i have my kids yeah uh, not so much like that <laughs> yeah um you know he, he he just loves it he's a student of the sport and mm -hmm. he loves studying it and he loves the logistics of it he's just good at that and so yeah I mean and, and I felt I feel energies you know I'm a little more of a woo-woo kind of girl like I just feel things and I'm a feeler and I I would feel if he was too nervous or something so I like knew to you know go talk to him or like what what he needed and I think in hindsight looking back at those like small things that we did for one another even as kids in high school and stuff it's like we did not appreciate it or see it at all but the little listings mm -hmm. were the most powerful there um but yeah I'm very my, my most proud moment in swimming aside from my own was watching him at the Olympics uh, I oh, thought yeah. that was probably the coolest thing and actually Olympic trials <laughs> yeah. was the coolest thing to watch him at so yeah yeah, absolutely. So talk to us about Rise Athletes. How did that come about and, and what is it all about? Yeah, so Rise started um, about 2014. I was finishing grad school in Tennessee for sports psychology. Uh, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> you know, I, I had no idea. Um, mm. And I knew that I wanted to go into the field, but I knew that I also wanted to do art. So I was like, I don't know what to do. I have these two degrees. Um, so Rebecca one day was like, you know, I started this mentoring platform where I'm working with athletes online and Rebecca on Sony. and like working. Yes. Yeah, sorry, Rebecca Sony. And we had been friends all through our careers as well. So, um, you know, it was like a very easy transition to talk to one another about. So, you know, she said, Hey, I have these athletes that I'm working with. Would you be interested in working with a few, uh, parents have been contacting me and I'm like, sure. <laughs> why not? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so then I started working with this young girl who I still work with to this day. Um, and she was fantastic. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the fact that I could do it from anywhere it's on the computer. Um, but I could work with, with them on their mindset and on their confidence. Next thing we know, uh, we've developed a whole curriculum. She had a lot of this work already done. She was really excited about it. So we, we tweaked some stuff, developed this curriculum, started bringing people on. Uh, Christy Kowal was our first hired mentor and we trained them on and, and they, you know, do all of the necessary steps to become a mentor, which is now a little more intricate than it was then. Um, and, you know, we start recruiting athletes to work with and bringing athletes on board to be part of our team. So it just started grassroots. It's still a very grassroots business, um, personal connections and, uh, you know, that interpersonal relationship is so important to us. Um, so yeah, we've been almost five years now and it's been a really cool experience um, to create it. And so excited to see where it goes now. We have about 18 Olympians and you know 50 ish 60 athletes that everybody works with individually so um yeah it's cool so people that want to nice. reach out and, and and be part of this you know maybe some some young kids some athletes uh how do they find you yeah so a lot of people find us on instagram or facebook um we also just are very big on word of mouth so we do in-person workshops which with teams, which then can they can choose if they want to continue to work individually um, with 
the Olympians, but usually the Olympians do their own outreach. That's been our goal from day one. We don't want to be a mill where we're just bringing people in through the internet. Um, this is a personal relationship. So they reach out to people, they get in touch with people and word of mouth spreads. And, you know, before you know it, you know, we have one mentor that has like 15 athletes, uh, which is a lot, you know, you're working with sex in psychology realm with 15 people every week. So, um, it's, it's a really cool experience for them so that they can give back to the community that they, that raised them, you know, with the skill sets that they have, that they want to use somehow. Um, and then at the same time, the athlete, I mean, if I was 15 years old, I would have killed to have had a Olympian to talk to every week, you know? So, uh, just, it's a really cool experience and all of the teachings are based around sports psychology, which are revenized degrees. So we created curriculum. So, you know, the Olympians have to train and pass the course and and do the work. So blended with their experience, they also have, uh, you know, a rite of passage to come through so that we are all on the same page on the same team teaching distant same things catered to each person. So, um, Yeah. Yeah. What are, what are some of the specific teaching modules or things that you guys work on with, with your athletes? So we do a lot of obstacle work. So a lot of um, ang- ang- whoa, ang- anxiety, performance anxiety, because a lot mm-hmm. of them come in with the preference being anxious, that needs yeah. some performance. Mm-hmm. So we do, we do uh, anxiety management. We do personal identity relationship we do team camaraderie um i mean there's like 20 topics but just for sake of i guess not boring everybody it's it's mainly uh based around overcoming obstacles Mm -hmm. um you know creating a better self-talk routine a better uh performance routine so that they can understand you know, visualization skills and imagery skills and pre-performance anxiety and how to control and harness all of that, you know, um, recovery, uh, life balance. Um, you know, we work on like aggression and assertiveness techniques. Like if people feel those kinds of tendencies, we work on burnout and plateau recovery. Um, Yeah. So it's a lot and it's very personalized. So when they come in, they take a survey that's pretty long and then we get to know them and then could they, you know, reel in their three main themes. So we start there on that track and work toward what they need that day too. So if they come in with something totally different than what the mentor had planned to work on, we pivot and work with them on what they need to overcome in that moment and in the moment feedback there. Wow, that's awesome. Sounds very thorough. Is this a, a situation where you feel yeah. like looking back on your career, if you had have had something like this, this is where you could have been better? Is that what you, you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I did not have anything like this growing up. I think we, we were told all of the things, but we did not actually focus on, on them in a way that was deliberate. That doesn't mean we, we did that, you know, we focused on them. But that doesn't mean that we sat down deliberately. We would do visualization work and some goal setting and things like that. Uh, But I think what is interesting about this concept now, especially with youth, is that it's up to them. And so by giving them the um, ownership of their own growth, that's where it's at. No one's going to tell them how to do it. Um, no one's going to, you know, well, tell, we'll give advice. Of course we're telling them how to do it, but no one's going to be like, here, sit down and this is going to change your life in five minutes. Like Mm. people want things and they want it now. And one of, one of my, our sayings is like, this is not a fix. So the first, when people come to us and they're like, can you talk to my kids tomorrow? And we're like, you know, sure, but this is not a band aid. That's not how this works. And so we're just very honest about that. And There is no quick fix. There is no way to do that. Yes, there is support. Yes, there is pump up. But there, this is consistent work. Like there is no quick fix. And you know that's that's the beauty of the work and mindset is it continues until you're on the Olympic podium. I mean, mine continued until you know I was literally months out that specific event, 
And to this day, it is still continuing for everything in my life. So mindset work is not something that you just do and then you're done with. Um, and so that's why our program is at least four months. Like when people sign on, it's a four month contract up front and then they can choose whether they want to continue. But in order to see change, just like anything else, there's no biohacking here, you know, like you can't just do it and then expect yourself to, to be fine. This is a, it's a lifelong journey. And so starting yeah. them while they're young and, and things like that is definitely the way to go, in my opinion. Oh, Very cool. Definitely. In my, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, say the name of the website because I say it with a funny mm -hmm. accent. So I want them to be able to get it. <laughs> yeah. It's riseathletes.com. So rise-athletes.com. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, wow. Yeah. Great, great concept. I think it's amazing. I wish I wish I had have had it. Yeah. You know, I look back and, and I have certain regrets in terms of things I could have done better for sure. You know, obviously as a coach yeah. now, I know, you know, I teach the things that, that I slipped on. I'm like, man, if I had have just had mm -hmm. this or done this, then I could have been much better in this circumstance. And so uh, something right, like right. A super powerful tool. I think it's awesome. Right. And just knowing that you have help and support, but that you have to do it yourself. That's the biggest, mm. the most one thing to remember is that no matter what help and support you seek, the choice is within you, you know, and, and you have the power to do that. So I am the biggest believer in asking for help. I just learned how to do that this past year. <laughs> so it's like just saying like, hey, I need help with this. And for someone to sit with you and listen to that while you make the choice to move forward with what it is that you need is extremely powerful so um yeah awesome well appreciate it even though i was on the other side of the pool deck uh you know competing for <laughs> auburn coaching for auburn at the yeah. time yeah you know, i was a big fan of yours i thought you were incredible I, yeah you're always a tough competitor and and I, and I was there on the pool deck when you broke that nca record you know in the 500 uh, yeah. and it was a, it was an incredible swim um so i look I think you should be very proud of your career, even though there's always things you'd like to take back and change and do things differently. But I think you are very successful. Yeah. I think you're uh, certainly an amazing role model with everything you've done in your life and, and what you continue to do. So, um, so I'm really appreciative. You just came on the show today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Take care, Caroline. Thanks. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.